I'm Keaton Makett uh, of Asset Strategy Consultants. Welcome everyone to Retirement Plan Trends for Short and Long-Term Success. I'm very excited that I get to dust off the tie today and I'm joined by Matt, Christina, and Doug to talk about some of the unique and topical parts of retirement planning and defined contribution plans. Uh, the goal of this meeting is to really enlighten both plan sponsors, participants, and our partners in the industry about uh, some of the key issues and solutions uh, that both Prudential and PIMCO uh, would like to speak about. Uh, we found it fascinating uh, what they came up with. I think you will too. Uh, a few housekeeping items, the way that this is going to work is I'll go into introductions. We'll talk about three key topics in the industry, and then there will be a question and answer session at the very end of the panel. I encourage all the participants to submit a question. I believe uh, Al at Asset Strategy Consultants, our fearless leader, will be able to go through those questions as they're asked throughout the presentation and answer those at the very end. Um, the one Disclaimer, I'll put the one caveat is we'll try to have a, if you remember a swear jar growing up, we really like this topic uh, of talking about financial concepts. If anyone that's a panelist gets caught up in the alphabet soup of QDIAs, ESGs, and, and don't actually explain what those things mean, you get the $5 in the uh, swear jar. So I'll slow the conversation down and make sure everyone's on the same page to talk about that. So Without further ado, uh, I'm Keaton Makett at Asset Strategy Consultants. I've been in the financial industry uh, my entire professional career after graduating from the University of Pittsburgh. I'm um, an investment advisor, an accredited investment fiduciary. I sit on a national advisory committee for sustainability when it comes to investments in DC plans, particularly in 401ks. Um, I've been in asset strategy for about four years, uh, coming up on five next year. It's hard to believe how time flies. Um, when you think about asset strategy consultants as a premier player in the industry, there's, a, there's a, been some great relationships established over 30 years. We have 54 institutional client relationships. Uh, the average tenure of those relationships is about 12 years. Uh, there, we have 16 investment professionals, including eight senior advisors who average uh, over 25 years of investment experience. We advise on over $8 billion in assets, including $2 billion of discretionary mandates. Um, we've also, in addition to our work in the foundation endowment world, we've been providing investment advice to private wealth clients since 2008. Uh, we're proud to say that since our founding, we're 100% employee owned and 33% uh, of our clients are defined contribution plans. Uh, with that, I will give the spotlight to Christina, Matt, and Doug. Uh, Christina, let's start with you. Please introduce yourselves. And again, thank you so much for taking some time this afternoon to join us. Of course. And thank you for having us and me. Um, I'm Christina Pijos. I'm Senior Vice President of PIMCO. Um, I focus specifically on working with plan sponsors such as yourselves and crafting and executing upon um, participant and communication strategies and making sure that your participants have what they need to get more comfortable with retirement investing. I guess I'll go. Uh, th thanks, Keaton. Uh, this is Matt Bannerman. I'm a, a vice president here at PIMCO. This is my eighth year at the firm. Um, and my role is to work with retirement plan advisors across eight states that I cover uh, in the mid-Atlantic part of the country. And I'm fortunate to see real time some of the latest trends that are going on with advisors with their plan sponsor clients. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the asset strategy team over the past several years and appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Thanks. And hi, everybody. Doug McIntosh from Prudential Retirement uh, will soon be moving to Empower Retirement um, if and as that transaction concludes, currently scheduled to the end of the first quarter. Um, I'm part of the investment product team. I lead the group that manufactures both asset management and um, call them services or models. We do some managed accounts. We do some model portfolios. And um, we also have responsibility for guaranteed income. Eaton, back to you, sir. Hey, thanks, everyone. Again, thank you for taking some time this afternoon. And I guess morning, I know we have people on both coasts uh, listening to this. So thanks. Thanks again. Uh, really, the goal for everyone listening is to work on some of the feedback we've gotten at Asset Strategy, and most plan sponsors have really not dusted off um, the design of their plan, especially in the COVID era. So what we're trying to do is 
is really ignite a conversation on a, under some of these uh, key topics. And, and Doug, we'll start with you. The first topic we're going to out uh, the importance of participant education when it comes to retirement plans and, and some of the things that Prudential Retirement's doing in that space. Thanks, Keaton. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that we will oftentimes talk about as we think about getting in front of participants and helping them to make the right decisions and trade-offs is who and, and when? Who are we trying to go after and when are we trying to go after them? And, and that's in part because we see so much inertia in the um, in the defined contribution space. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the autos have become prevalent and I think rightly so, Good, you know, great, great tools um, that uh, a sponsor and their advisor can use to help design a plan that is really optimized for best outcomes for um, participants. You know, one of the things that, and, and no surprise given where we are right now, but this, this persists over time. One of the things that participants tend to be most concerned about is doing the right thing, making sure that they have um, taken the right actions in terms of both where to put their money and, and how much to save. And I think it's, it's um, an increasing area of focus for our industry, not I think, I know, because we're focusing on it for sure, um, but we need to be putting tools and resources in the hands of um, participants. And maybe, um, Keaton and, and Helen, we could pull up that first um, slide, which shows a little bit, um, what uh, participants are talking about when they say, here's where we need uh, a hand or two. Um, <clears throat> I won't rattle through all of the um, items here, but just to, um, to touch on some of the most important things, longer term planning. So how are we making sure we're thinking all the way through to retirement? Having money to pay for unexpected expenses. This is, this is of course, uh, a topic that comes back to mind as we think about what life is like in the COVID era, but, I think, again, a perennial conversation for, um, for folks um, uh, on the participant side. Um, and then, of course, we can also talk about ancillary benefits as well. As an individual, do I think about my retirement plan discreetly? No, I do not. I think about all the different financial pressures I have. And certainly, as we get older, um, healthcare issues tend to become more and more important over time. Now, the last thing I guess I would, I would point to is the fact that a relatively small number of individuals, 16% by our count, will say that they have access to the sorts of tools and resources that they need. Reality may be a little bit different. There may be a slightly higher percentage of individuals who have access, um, but regardless, as an industry, I think we need to take a good, long, hard look at ourselves in the mirror and say, what have we done to make sure that these individuals know that they have these tools, know how to access them, and then want to access and are willing to access? How are we making that helpful for them? Those are the things I think that um, are consuming most of the caloric burn on, on our end, Keith. Uh, that's a great answer. Thanks for, thanks for that, Doug. Uh, Christina, can you chime in? What, uh, what's the outlook at PIMCO and what are you seeing on personalization for plan participants in the retirement plan space? Sure. Um, uh, what we're kind of seeing, you know, at least in the work that I've done with plan sponsors lately, is really, you know, there's this general notion that personalization is expensive. And to some degree it is, but a lot of the time, big data and big tech are making it easier and easier by the day. Um, so, you know, the record keeper partners, you know, like firms like Empower um, and, and PGM, um, Prudential, excuse me, um, you know, they're finding additional ways to make it more cost effective to embed personalization, um, which is good for, you know, everybody here on the phone listening, because, you know, if you go back to where participants and employees, where, the, where they look, what's their, who, who and where are their first stops to learn more about the financial resources that they have available, um, you know, the employer is the first stop. They look to the employer to see what resources they have at their in their hands because they know that their employer has done all the legwork and trying to find, you know, the best solutions for their people. Um, you know, it, there's uh, MetLife put out an employee benefit trend study um, that really talked about, you know, how employees lean on employers in terms of you know, do they have an onus in their financial well-being um, based upon the resources that they provide employees? So, you know, which is great. So, but that then, you know, if as a plan sponsor, 
taking a look at how relevant you can make these benefits, specifically retirement benefits, you know, you have to get past a couple of hurdles. And we've all heard about behavioral finance or consumer behavior, you know, what we used to call it back in the 90s. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, but there's a lot of biases and, and mind hurdles that we have to get past in order for our employees and participants to pay attention, right? Um, so, you know, personalization is one of those tools to get past those biases. Because, you know, we all get junk mail, right? So, when you go to your mailbox and you see junk mail and it's like too, you know, too resonant or something like that, you know, it's not for you. So you just throw it out. Right. Um, so, you know, personalization, even if, even in its babyest of steps is very, very effective. Um, and when, uh, you know, on the slides that we have, if, if Helen could bring them up, um, so there's lots of steps that plan sponsors can take now, um, to get, you know, to ramp up their personalization in their communications. So, but before we get into that, all of that, you gotta kind of, you know, take care of the table stakes and the best practices around communications in general. So that's repetition is your friend. Um, I believe the, there's the rule of seven that says you have to hear the same message seven times before you take action. Um, thank you, Helen. Um, kind of like my kids, right? I have a five-year-old, it takes, them, it takes me seven times to tell them to do the same thing before he actually does it. You know, employees aren't, you know, employees are, have busy lives. It's kind of the same, it's kind of the same concept. Um, using different multimedia, using videos, emails, sending things home so that spouses can read them, like that's all at your fingertips to use and you should be using it, or at least you should be taking it into account. But in terms of personalization, there's two things that you know you should you should get a handle on right off the bat: tracking engagement of your communications. You want to make sure that what you're using and what you're deploying is actually reading, reaching your audience, and they're actually absorbing it. Um, in order, if you can't take advantage of personalization features like marketing automation, which I'll get to in a second, you know, create sample profiles that reflect um, many a, a good portion of your employee population, so they can relate to that content. So that's the left-hand side of the screen that you see. On the right-hand side are further baby steps into personalization. Um, and it's really thinking through what your employees, the decisions that your employees make around, you know, their benefits and their retirement investing. So it's thinking through that experience. You most likely have very distinct segments of employees within your population, whether it's you have a large female population or you have a very young population. That messaging changes with each of those peoples. Um, so it's really important that you get a better understanding about how they, the messages they take, that they take and how they take it, whether it's mobile or email or traditional snail mail. Um, the biggest thing that you should, the, the one place that you should really start with in, in regards to personalization is talk to your record keeper. They have tools and resources that they can turn on because they have access to all that employee, employee information that they can customize communications for each of your objectives. Like if you wanna do a savings campaign, they can say, hi, Keaton, we know you have X amount. We know you defer, you know, Y amount. Maybe you should bump it up 1%. So there are a lot of pick, uh, tips and tricks that you can use today to kind of get you there. And what we're finding now is that plan sponsors are really waking up to that and bringing it to their employees. Yeah, well said, Christina and Doug, thank you. Um, Helen, if you could just switch to the next slide. Now, one of the key issues we, we are trying to address right now is really focusing on the specific life stages and customizing plans for plan participants as they approach the, the, the danger zone you see in red towards retirement about five to 10 years out. And really, when you start out and you think of, you remember back to your first job, most people start out on a similar playing field with zero dollars in their retirement account. And as they grow and approach that, that danger zone close to retirement date, uh, people get unique and situations become more complex. And and planning gets more difficult, which is why uh, some of the techniques that Doug and Christina spoke about, customization, personalization, really makes sense on, on the individual plan participant side, whether it's, it's custom target dates that are embedded in retirement plans or separately managed accounts to provide a almost like a handholding for plan participants that require that special guidance. 
we want to help plan sponsors and investment committees provide those customization resources so that the conversation for plan participants is more dynamic as opposed to just saying, well, when you approach retirement, you need to reduce your equity exposure and focus more on income. There needs to be, there's a hunger to, to have, that, have that issue answered. And there are a lot of options to Doug and Christina's point that, uh, that provide those solutions. If you just flip to the next slide, we've really been focused on uh, benefits for the plan participant. Um, make no mistake, this is actually a, a benefit for plan sponsors and the employer as well. Again, especially because of COVID, a lot of these employee benefits have not seriously been revisited since the very first part of 2020. Retirement plan design and optimizing that plan design is a can be a really nice recruitment tool in order to hire the right kind of people, but also retain and make sure they stay at your business and are not poached by someone else with richer benefits. And the last benefit for, for plan sponsors and employers is really making sure and helping their employees retire on time. I think everyone on the call is aware of some of the increased costs that delayed retirement in your workforce will cause. And we wanna make sure that we can help plan sponsors and investment committees uh, help their participants, but also help themselves as well. So with that, we'll, we'll turn to the next topic and we'll talk about the what we call the decumulation phase in the retirement income phase. Um, Doug, I think we'll start with you again. Um, many industry participants feel the SECURE Act of 2019 is, is really the beginning of a serious push towards retirement income and defined contribution plans. Uh, would you say that's a fair assessment? Uh, I, th I think so, Keaton. Yeah, I think I think it is fair to say that the dialogue in the last couple of years since the Secure Act passed at the very end of 2019 has certainly gone um, through the roof, at least from our perspective. And um, I, I think many of the, the folks who are listening today would um, would agree it's much more on their minds than it was before, um, in in no small measure because of the Secure Act. But I think it's important for us to remember that this push towards increasing access to retirement income vehicles goes back quite a long way. We can think about, for example, the Pension Protection Act in 2006, um, which offered the foundations for the autos as being a, a component or, or a beginning um, uh, element in, in that push. Certainly the QDIA regulation itself, final rate came out in 07, and it included guaranteed vehicles as part of, of QDIA where appropriate. Um, and then since then, we've had other um, uh, pronouncements from both uh, Department of Labor and Treasury. Um, for example, um, the 08 um, annuity safe harbor, the 2015 update to the safe harbor, uh, a bunch of different things from Treasury, and also interestingly, the GAO. And then, of course, the SECURE Act. Um, we're starting to call it SECURE Act 1, because we believe there's going to be a SECURE 2.0 coming in the not too distant future. Um, and um, one of the questions, and maybe we could click, um, forgive me for going out of order here, but Helen, do you want to just click through a couple more pages and talk a little bit about the SECURE, um, yeah, the SECURE Act, and um, uh, we can go back to some of the topics we were touching on before. I, Keaton, your, your image of that equity slide down, I think, is, is a really important one for us to keep in mind. But I think what we want to, what we want to bear in mind is that legislators and regulators together so, you know, the Washington, D.C. establishment, if you will, are really focused on trying to, I'm going to use their, the term that's used in, in D.C., to increase the, increase the availability and utilization of retirement income vehicles. And we can divide them into both guaranteed retirement and predictable retirement. And I think it's important to think about both and to present both, um, uh, present them um, to our committees and, and, and where appropriate to our participants. Why is that? It's simple. Things are changing in our in our um, in our retirement landscape. Defined benefit is no longer the standard, and with the exception of a couple of pockets here and there, it really is in its way out. It's being phased out. I think that's a shame in many ways, but it's not something we can um, afford to waste a lot of time talking about. So that being the case, how do you then shore up the system? And it is very clear, going all the way back to 0607 the 08, that um, Washington is looking to um, define contribution plans to help bolster 
particularly in that in that arena of um, of, uh, of lifelong income, getting access to lifelong income. Um, and maybe to put the point on that, um, we could click back a few pages to Keaton's um, image, um, that, that that waterfall, if you will. Look at look at um, the younger um, participant. You know, we're we're suggesting that on average or generally best practice is loads and loads of equity exposure. It's so true. The two things when we had this long philosophical conversation with a, a managed account uh, player a couple of years ago, and geez, that seems like a long time ago now, uh, pre-COVID, um, and we just went on and on about the two major factors for the younger investor: save a ton, get as aggressive as you can. Nothing else matters. But to the point Keaton made, as time goes by, those other factors start to really increase in importance. Where do you have other sources of money? What is your risk tolerance, et cetera? And so that's why you're, we're, we're going to see the rise of increased personalization to take a page out of uh, Christina's book and um, further uh, uh, customization at the participant level. All right. I said a mouthful there. <laughs> Let me clam up for a sec and turn it back to you. I appreciate that. Uh, Matt, I know you'd like to chime in here. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about um, income and retirement and what uh, what solutions PIMCO's uh, talking about here after uh, or as the new year starts? Sure. And uh, maybe, Helen, we can hop to, to my slide as well while I'm uh, kicking off initial comments. So we just uh, published our 15th annual Defined Contribution Consulting Study. I know Keaton has the full version of that. He can send that along after the call today. Uh, but the, a clear trend is the area of retaining participant assets in plan once they retire. So back when we did this survey back in 2015, 46% uh, of respondents felt that their clients preferred to either retain assets in plan. Um, and, I, and I think that number was fairly lower than we were expecting. I think uh, mo more than half of that, the plan, 54%, uh, we're either indifferent or actually prefer that participants take their money when they leave at retirement. Fast forward to this year, so only six years later, we asked the same question to the respondents. And that number uh, that would prefer to actually keep participants in plan has increased all the way up to 74%. So clearly something has changed in the last six years. And, and we think that's actually a pretty positive uh, forecaster of, of future development in this space. So the slide that we have on the screen now um, is actually one where we asked respondents uh, which actions can they take today with their clients uh, to encourage retirees to retain their assets in plan. Uh, the first step, and it seems like a simple one, but it's actually uh, the easiest one to implement, uh, is to set up your plan document to allow for distribution flexibility. Uh, believe it or not, most plans still today only allow for lump sum or only. Uh, or lump sum or nothing. And so I think from my, my perspective, this is this hit home personally, my dad just recently retired and he was in the financial services industry as well. Uh, but when he retired after 20 years at his company, uh, his only option in his plan was to take his entire balance out. And I think that I, could, I saw that firsthand how stressful that was uh, to, to really try to recreate a paycheck that he had been receiving from this same company for over 20 years. And I think a, a, a better avenue would have been to allow for installment payments or uh, semi-monthly uh, distributions so he could recreate that paycheck more easily in retirement, stay in those in institutionally priced vehicles. There is certainly a benefit for having a lar larger plan size and access to certain investments that you might not be able to get on your own in terms of purchasing power. Uh, so that one's actually one I would encourage uh, everyone on the phone today to, to take a look through and see if that's something your plan document allows for and maybe have that conversation at a committee level. The next two areas are really in Christina's wheelhouse in terms of participant education. I think uh, the creation and working with the record keeper on things like retirement tools or maybe short little educational videos that are targeted to those that are getting closer to retirement it's probably a good idea to start that thought process going. As, as we all know, um, as participants get into that early 60-year-old age range, they're certainly thinking about retirement uh, more than they probably let on. And so, so that's an area in terms of adding those tools and education, um, as well as they can set up uh, what we call a retirement tier and start to educate participants and draw their attention to 
investment options that are really set up for post-retirement, uh, really that decumulation phase that, that Keaton had showed in that uh, chart a few slides ago. And then I'm not gonna go through all these, but the, the other one I wanted to touch on was allowing for consolidation of non-plan assets. Uh, this, I think there, there really is, uh, as a former CPA myself, I like the idea of buckets for your assets. And it's very hard for someone to visualize uh, their total retirement picture without being able to see where their assets are outside of just their 401k plan. And I think as uh, many of the record keepers allow that ability to import some of those assets, I think that allows for more of a, a clearer picture. Uh, I know we're going to get to talk a little bit about the, the actual products, both uh, guaranteed income based as well as market based solutions. But I think some of these uh, areas and ideas that you hear uh, that you that I've uh, reviewed through, hopefully will be things that you can take uh, a look at for your own individual plan and see if that's something you want to uh, proceed with. That's great. Thank you to the both of you. Uh, Matt, a, a quick question for you. You spoke about distribution flexibility. That's a really great point that most plans don't have uh, in their design. Could you talk about how, how often or, or maybe infrequent you see that provision inside a plan? Yeah, I mean, most advisors that I talk to, uh, when they sometimes they actually think the plan does have that. They're like, well, why wouldn't they have that flexibility? And then come to find out, you, you go and check with your record keeper and that's not written into your plan document. Uh, so I would say the vast majority of folks, Keaton, when they take a look at that plan doc, uh, it actually does not have that flexibility. Uh, that, that said, over the past couple of years is uh, folks like Asset Strategy and other leading specialists in, the, in this area have started to uh, go back to those plan documents and, and take a look at those and make those changes. Uh, I, I think it's really growing in, in popularity and could be something that as participants, and we know a lot of people are changing jobs as they go to uh, new employers, they might be asking for that same capability. Well, you're right. That's, that's certainly been the trend. Uh, Helen, if you could move to the next slide. Uh, we, we really see that plan sponsors are modifying their plan to, to allow the, that type of flexibility. Um, one, of the, one of the issues people really don't think about until they retire is kind of like you said, Matt, um, hey, where's my paycheck going to come from? I, I've worked for 40, 50 years. I'm used to getting that paycheck in the mail or direct deposit every two weeks until you quit your job, roll the money out of the plan, open up a, an account, get everything set up. You do automatic distribution. It's, it's, it's a complete process. What we found out is that it's, it's very popular for, for an in-plan option for plan participants. And, and, and really, if you look at the, the slide that's on the screen, it, it really satisfies the, the below the dotted line, the needs. Um, this really shows needs versus one in retirement and, and a guaranteed income, uh, an employer sponsored kind of guaranteed income option really provides for the needs. So that would be fixed food, uh, housing, transportation, paying insurance premiums, and making sure that those necessities in retirement are accounted for, as opposed to um, some of the discretionary spending, uh, entertainment, travel, education, transportation, clothing, um, which, which might have a place in outside investments or coming in from social security, wh whatever the case may be. But there, there certainly is a need to, to consider optimizing your plan and focus on uh, distribution flexibility and providing that income for plan participants. Um, great, great. Well, well, thank you to the both of you on, in talking about that. Uh, looks like just, just to be respectful of everyone's time, I'd like to move right into the uh, last topic here, which would be uh, innovative enhancements to investment options. And um, Matt, we'll really start with you because I know this is going to be a meaty part of the conversation here this afternoon. Um, as, as the world and the regulatory environment change, um, can, you, can you talk about what you're seeing um, in the universe of investment options and DC plans? Um, can you speak a little bit on maybe the SECURE Act and how things have changed since then and what PIMCO is doing to address some of those changes? Yeah, and keep me honest here, Keaton, this, this is a difficult area to get through without paying one of those $5 fines. So uh, <laughs> Try your hardest. a lot of lingo here. Um, Helena, I wanted to pull up, uh, one, this is my 
back, speaking back to our DC consulting study, this continues to be one of my favorite slides in there that I'd like to take a look at every year. And what we asked respondents for uh, was if they were to start with a blank sheet of paper today, how many investment options would they have in a core lineup menu? And what surprises me is that each year we come, they come back with a very streamlined uh, view. And essentially with the whole concept of less is more for participants and not trying to overwhelm them with the number of options, this has changed over the past couple of decades. In fact, it wasn't too long ago where you would find most plans would have 40, 50, 60 investment options. Some out there that sometimes we see litigation around this that they have 200 or 300 investment options. That's certainly a lot for, to ask for someone to decide, should I be in a retirement plan? How much should I be saving? Oh, and now I have to figure out which investments I, I go into. And so the feedback we got from the respondents is that the optimal number is actually 11 or 12 options in the core menu. So those would be the standalone options that participants can select from. And then you would also have your uh, target date funds or managed account portfolios. If you total that all up, it ends up to be the most optimal amount is around 20. And some of you may be looking at your plans today saying, well, I have, I have many more than 20 in here. Um, and that's okay, right? This is the optimal amount. This is starting from a blank sheet of paper, uh, but most all plans have their own unique history. And so if you're in that sort of mid twenties, the high twenties, consider yourself doing a, a very uh, good service to your participants by keeping it streamlined. But there's a lot of what we would call wood to chop out there in terms of the average plan having 40 or 50 investment options. We encourage that anytime you're looking at considering, and we're gonna go through three different ideas uh, of adding a new option to the plan, that you also take the time to look at your existing menu of options to see, is there one that we can make a trade off here? Maybe it has half of 1% of plan assets and it was a great idea when we added it five years ago, just no participants have really taken us up on, on investing in that asset class. Um, so as we go through these three ideas, I would encourage you to, to, to take a look at your uh, current investment lineup that way. On the next page is where we get into those uh, three ideas. And, and the whole topic of today's conversation is around innovation. And innovation can happen in um, investment menus as well. By far, the most popular investment option that uh, has been considered and we've been involved in conversations with over the past 12 to 18 months should be no surprise, it's around inflation. I mean, the Federal Reserve is gonna be talking about inflation here this afternoon. I have my calendar marked for, for 2 p.m. today. Um, I'm a big market nerd, so I know when uh, Jerome Powell is gonna give his update on inflation. And right now it's a big fear, not only for, I have three young kids, every time we go to the grocery store, it feels like it's costing an extra $25, $50 more every time we go. Cars are costing more, right? All these elevation and costs. That has become so mainstream that many plan sponsors are starting to think about how can we put a, an option, investment option in our plan to hedge against that that is outside of traditional stocks and bonds. So to the left-hand side of the page are the different vehicles that typically are selected for to hedge against inflation. Those are things like TIPS, which are inflation protected bonds. There, I don't have to pay the $5 fine. I explained what TIPS were. Uh, real estate investment trust, as those are the REITs, think of that as uh, commercial buildings, uh, large real estate holdings. Um, and then commodities is also uh, four, fifth down on the page, is typically used to hedge against inflation. We all know that uh, as oil prices go up, that tends to track inflation as well. But the most uh, popular recently, keeping on the theme of keeping investment menus streamlined, um, has been multi-real asset. And the concept there is to have one fund that provides access, access to things like tips, real estate, commodities. And because it's only one fund and you're letting the investment manager decide, maybe can include things like MLPs, gold, some of the other uh, inflation hedges without having to add multiple options to the menu and also um, having participants give them the ability to put 100% of their money in any one of these options I know that uh, Keaton, your team at Asset Strategy prefers this multi-real asset approach. And I think you were early to the trend there in recognizing that inflation comes in all different uh, shapes and sizes and allowing one manager to 
to select amongst those is, is definitely the most beneficial way to do that. We, we spoke about another key area is on the topic of alternatives. And we don't have to get into the specifics of what alternatives are, but just think of them as uh, investment vehicles that are not traditional stocks or bonds. And this has typically been seen in the large mega plan market space where uh, these companies tend to have an internal treasury team or teams that work on their defined benefit plan, for example, and are already comfortable with these non-traditional assets. Like many other trends in the 401k, 403b space, they tend to happen from the, the large mega plan market space and come down market. But there's been two big obstacles that have uh, really created a hurdle for alternatives. The first being fees. We are certainly in a fee-centric environment. The litigious world that we're in, it, sometimes it feels like 401k and 403b is the new asbestos. There's just so much litigation in this area. And a lot of it has to do with fees. So the fees that alternatives have charged in the past, which can be two or three times the traditional mutual fund, uh, that is certainly a hurdle that, they get, that they're going to have to get over. And secondarily, uh, liquidity. So most of these alternatives, the reason they can provide additional return and a lot of diversification is that uh, they do invest in some types of investments that are liquid, meaning that they can't be transacted in on a day-to-day -day basis. So in a 401k or 403b plan, you do need to have that daily liquidity for participants to, to be able to provide them uh, the, the opportunity to transact either way. So what I think is going to happen here and what came through in our study is that if you take alternatives and you plug them inside of a target date fund uh, or a managed account structure that I talked about earlier, instead of allowing it as a standalone option, would not only keep the menu concise, but also would allow some additional diversification within that uh, managed account or target date fund solution. And the last area I was gonna to cover today is on the topic of ESG. This outside of inflation is the number two area that our team typically is talking about with advisors and plan sponsors. Uh, in this, in this uh, survey, we asked respondents uh, to talk about ESG equities and fixed income. Uh, we, we see interest in both. More recently, we've been seeing more interest in ESG uh, fixed income, but ESG is essentially in environmental social governance. And what we see with a lot of different uh, participants and plans is that as consumers, they're really interested in what our company is doing in each of these three key areas. And they're actually making decisions on which products and services to select based on how ESG friendly uh, that company is or is not relative to other products that they could be having from other companies. And this has led to participants to say, well, how am I investing my money? Is that also ESG friendly? Or that some of those same companies um, having their stocks or bonds invested in by the investment manager with an eye towards ESG? And so this is something that uh, Congress, uh, DOL, et cetera, in Washington from a regulatory perspective has definitely switched back and forth depending on what administration has been in place. But I think this trend is too strong for it to go away uh, despite regulatory headwinds, which are starting to become a little more positive on this front. I think it's gonna be only a matter of time in the future where uh, ESG will be very prevalent in plans. And I think hopefully as an industry, we get to a point where you don't even need to have the ESG label because most investment managers will already have that built into their process. So these are three things as you look into 2022 uh, that, that are trends that the asset strategy team has done a lot of work on and would be happy to share their thoughts with you. Yeah, th thanks for that, Matt. Um, Helen, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Matt. Thanks again for that. Uh, we, we have tried to be, uh, during COVID, I, I would say we were probably one of the most forward thinking um, advisors in the country talking about uh, envir or environmental, social and governance funds and what negative screening looks like. And it's one of the key issues that new partnerships uh, speak about. So when we sit at the table with investment committees, um, there's a lot of buzz around ESG impact investing, uh, divesting from what have you, whether it's fossil fuels or the war industry, firearms or tobacco, there really seems to be a push uh, both from plan sponsors and the feedback they're getting for participants 
uh, about impact investing, green investing, ESG. So we've done a lot of research on that and are happy to uh, talk about that further um, outside of this panel event. Uh, there's a lot of, to Matt's point, there's a lot of regulation and, and thoughts about that. So we're really waiting for the green light to, to put everything into action, but it's certainly an exciting uh, exciting topic. And uh, you know we're happy to, happy to talk to anyone about that. Um, what you're looking at here is really to the point of optimizing uh, fund options inside a retirement plan. You know, one of the one of the key issues that we're seeing with plan sponsors uh, with new partnerships is that they really haven't updated and helped their plan participants um, adapt to the, the changing world. So. The fund menu has been the same five years ago, has been the same 10 years ago. They're not talking about inflation protection, which Matt touched on. You brought up a really good point, Matt. Um, you know, instead of adding, if you look at the bottom right side of the screen, instead of adding a, a treasury inflation protected security or real estate or natural resources, uh, a very popular solution that asset strategies come up with is, is kind of blending those into one option so that you're not filling up the fund menu or the investment menu for plan participants. Um, so we've had some really good success in, in creating a solution for plan participants in that capacity. Um, we've, we've also had some great focus in, in reducing risk or, or what we call hedges in the industry. And typically when we go into a new partnership and do an analysis of their investment lineup, we, we see it's very limited in regard to the fixed income space. Um, a popular, popular conversation for us in, in the past few months has really been to talk about incorporating a, a short duration fixed income, fixed income product um, that has, or, or something that has a lower sensitivity to interest rates um, and really creating a, a carving out a place for that in regard to investment menus. And then uh, up top, it's really the, the return enhancers alpha. There's really a place for all three of these in retirement plans, um, whether it's smaller mid-cap domestic equities, international global bonds. Uh, there's, really, there's really an opportunity for us to sit down with plan sponsors and investment committees to help them optimize the options that exist in the retirement plan uh, so ultimately they can help their plan participants um, at least give them the, the opportunity to make the right selections. Um, and with that, I think that's our final slide. Um, I know that we wanted to carve out some time at the very end here. Oh, right on the right on the 145 mark. Um, Al, I know that you wanted to conduct some question and answers. I hope that there have been some questions fired our way over the last 45 minutes. Uh, would you like to take the opportunity to review those and answer some things that have come up? Hold for a second. All right, Keaton, thanks very much. And it's always nice to have uh, feedback from participants. And the first one, and I'm gonna have Helen go to slide 13. And this deals with a very important question on retirement income. And there's a series of annuity products that are called in-plan annuities. This is what the gentleman was looking for. 13, go back, there we go, nope. Dealing with, again, annuities designed for DC plans and how do they differ from the retail annuities that always tend to get a fairly negative reception with high fees, a lot of uh, limitations. So one of our panelists could take a few minutes on an in-plan annuity versus a, a typical retail annuity. I think it'd be insightful and this chart provides some of the comparative information. That's where you pulled it up. Yeah, Al, um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, thanks. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. And um, I think we can dissect it into a couple of different components. Um, first of all, in-plan versus retail almost always means that in-plan, I'm going to get a vehicle, a product, an offering, which has been stripped down and simplified. Now, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is it's important to bring costs down. Secondly, think about what Matt and Christina were saying, and Keaton too for that matter, a, a couple of minutes ago. Complexity is not your friend in the um, defined contribution environment. So we're, we're trying as, as providers 
to keep things as simple as as uh, as we can. There's another reason why there's is a lower cost typically for an implant versus a retail vehicle, and that's because there's no advisor attached. I would be very far back in the line of people who want to say that you know that that an advisor fee is is inappropriate. Why? Because when I pay the additional fee that helps to compensate an advisor, what do I get? You get an advisor, and that can be enormously helpful. I think that's an important thing for each individual to consider. But the point I think still stands. It is a fair it is a fair statement to say that in plan versus out of plan, in plan versus retail, we're always going to see a, a fee differential. You know. For that reason, if for, if for no other. Now, let's think also a little bit about the different types of um, ways to attack this retirement income vehicle. And what you see here on the page in front of you, going down the left-hand side, are three different primary mechanisms that we can think about for going after retirement income, be it you know, be it um, guaranteed or predictable. And the first one, we oftentimes will call a short. A shorthand, I don't know if I'm going to get a $5 fine for this, Keen, but we call best efforts, a vehicle that um, does not deliver an income guarantee, but is managed by a bunch of really smart folks, typically a, an asset manager and sometimes a, uh, a managed account player, to help an individual make sense of the trajectory through the retirement years. There are a lot of pros and cons. You know, One pro is I've got access to my money at all times. Another is it's pretty darn cheap. One of the cons is I'm not going to get a solid guarantee of lifelong income. So I've got to manage that really carefully. The next variant that we can think about is the traditional annuity. And this is where I, the participant, engage in a contractual relationship with a guarantor. I'm going to give them a stack of change, and they're going to give me income for the rest of my life, and maybe for my spouse, too, if, if, if I want. Now, in, in its simplest form, that transaction concludes at that point. The guarantor has the money. I've got the stream of income. And once I pass away and my spouse passes away, that's it, the stream ceases. For reasons that we could take another whole hour and talk about, um, that is a hurdle for participants, giving up control over the underlying assets. But let's not forget, there are some really strong, powerful things that um, a vehicle of this sort can do, namely the lifelong income we just talked about, and where an individual is accessing it pre-retirement, guess what? Maybe I get some protection against a market that goes haywire right before I retire. Then lastly, when we go down the left-hand side, we get to what? the so-called hybrid living benefit guaranteed withdrawal benefit vehicle, where you have both aspects. I get lifelong income, but I also keep control over the underlying assets. And it's this form, because it blends these two participant desires, that has really taken the lion's share between ourselves and um, the Alliance Bernstein Jumbo product really is the lion's share of the, of the implant market. Now, I, I, I mentioned that it does two wonderful things. It gives me income for the rest of my life and it gives me control over my assets. That comes at a cost. It is, it is you know, going to be always more expensive than a vehicle that does not have a guarantee. That kind of makes sense. But back to our questioner's uh, point, I can access this vehicle in plan or out of plan. It's going to be cheaper in plan versus out of plan. Last thing I would ask folks to think about, do we want to make available to our employees, to our participants, a retirement income vehicle that they can access while they're still working? Or do we want to give them access to something that is institutionally priced that they wait until they're retired to take advantage of? Loads of pros and cons to that as well. And we can see some of them on the screen. But one thing that I would ask folks to think about is, if we deploy a vehicle pre-retirement, can that help with behavior? Can that help a participant who might otherwise be very nervous and bail out of an up, upside exposure, riskier asset, keep them in place, knowing that they've got an income stream? Um, or does it make sense to just simplify things administratively and say, here you go, you've retired, we got some great you know, items for you. And that's a decision that each plan, each sponsor, each employer has to make, consulting with you know, the good folks at the asset strategy uh, or when they go through that process. So let me, let me cut it off there. I, I could go a lot longer, Keith, but time's a waste. Hi, Dad. To uh, uh, get off mute. Here there we are. <laughs> so, Doug, thank you. And Christina, Matt, anything you'd like to add before we move on to another question? I think is uh, appropriate that I'll use next. But before sure, I, I mean, this is Matt. I, th I think I would just add that there's a lot of innovation underway here. So even though there's been a handful of products that have come to market, uh, rest assured, all the investment providers, including Pimco, are 
working very hard in this space to roll out different solutions. And I think it's not gonna be a one size fits all for, for plant sponsors across the country. I think this type of conversation that you have in this chart here is going to be uh, very beneficial to, to go through with each individual plan sponsor, given their participant demographics, given their, their goals for their overall plan and really balancing uh, the different alternatives that are out there. Our job as investment providers is to make sure that we have well thought out solutions that we bring to market and, and give advisors like yourself a choice in what they recommend potentially to clients. If I can jump in there um, from a participant engagement perspective, um, if, if you are considering going down, um, you know, implementing retirement income vehicles or retirement income solutions, you know, consider your communication strategy. Um, you know, we're seeing um, employers, you know, begin that strategy at age 50 um, to help people make the mind shift of save, save, save to what can I generate on a monthly basis in retirement? I would actually say start it even earlier and make it part of your, your culture from the very beginning. Um, many record keepers show the lump sum, um, you know, as they continue to save for retirement, but it also generates a retirement, uh, a monthly payout as well. So keeping people, you know, in that mindset of you're, you're focusing on creating um, income in retirement way down in the future makes that transition a lot easier as you get closer to retirement. So. Very good. Thank you. And here's a follow-up question from another individual that actually is linked to uh, the target date issue with the use of these guaranteed minimum draw benefits. How would a plan sponsor approach since a large majority of participants are in target dates? How can that be added to that QDIA component of the, uh, the, the plan design? There are a couple of ways that this can be done. One is to put a standalone guaranteed income vehicle into the plan and allow participants to select that with a portion of, or all, all of if they want, um, of their assets. Um, so that'd be a voluntary action. You have to educate participants, make sure they understand what they're doing, and then they can take action. Another way to do it would be, and, and I think we're going to increasingly see the ability to do this with target dates, with managed accounts and model portfolios. Um, and we do all three today. Um, will be to um, have the income option added programmatically so the participant doesn't need to take action at a given point in time by the system, so to say, and in a proportion that makes sense for the plan sponsor. So you could, for example, consider the, the case of a target date fund where 10 years before the actual target date, so let's say for the 2035 fund beginning in 2025, the entirety of the balance in the target date fund gets wrapped with a guarantee. You could also have in a model portfolio or managed account, have a new asset class pop in, that being the guaranteed income asset class in the proportion that makes sense for the, you know, for that plan. So it could be 20, 30, 50, 70%. Um, and um, the benefit of that is I, the participant, don't have to go out of my way to remember, I got to do this thing at a certain point in time, let's make sure I do it at the right time. And also, um, and this, I think, in some ways is almost as important, I'm 30 years old. I'm not getting into the guaranteed retirement thing. That's not happening until I'm 55 or 60. And then we think it's very important for the younger investor to take as much, um, you know, what do the uh, options traders call it, naked risk in the market as possible. Get out there and take as much equity exposure as you can. Set aside as much as you can. Don't worry about the guarantee until you're get closing in on retirement. Then we can, you know, load you up with an additional fee and give you the protection that comes with that fee. Um, so those are the ways I think that we would uh, that we would approach that. Thanks, Doug. Again, Christina and Matt, anything you'd like to add? No, I think it's just. Uh... We're very appreciative of all the different record keepers that we work with and that there's, this is a lot of complexity to add to a plan in terms of making these transactions not only work on their respective platforms, but we continue to hear all of the reinvestment that is needed to be made in the industry to allow this to go across platforms, which ultimately will be uh, one of the key drivers for continued uptake is the ability to take it with you uh, should you decide to go to a, a different platform or should the plan sponsor decide to, to change platforms. So 
Uh, we're certainly appreciative of that. We do not have our own record keeping system. So each of the partners that we work with, uh, we always say thanks for their continued development and reinvestment in this area. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with Matt. I don't really have much to add there, except that the record keepers are the glue to all of this. So a much appreciation for them um, as they continue to, to manage this in this very complex environment. Very good, thank you. I think we have time for one more. This is not quite as complex, but one of the uh, questions that came up is getting into, um, let me read this again. So keeping participants in the plan, what's the benefit to the plan sponsor or benefits, I should say? So I, I can start us off and I'm sure Matt will jump in. Um, so there's, there's, there's a couple of benefits, some of them very altruistic and paternalistic. So, you know, keeping um, retiring uh, participants in the plan, I mean, if you've created that solution that Matt had referred to earlier called the retirement tier, which is really just another menu on your plan that is focused on the needs of retirees. So income, making sure that, you know, you, they're invested in enough equity so that their money's working for them when they're not. You know, you still provide that help into retirement, even though they've stopped working for you. Um, you know, from a from a from a numbers perspective, in working with asset managers, having that bulk within the plan and having all those assets under management can provide some um, some some pricing flexibility and some pricing power. Um, so really, it, it's 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 beneficial to both the plan sponsor and the participant. Uh, to keep them within the plan. Um, and as Doug mentioned earlier, there's always some, some cost effectiveness on the participant side as well. Maybe there's some investments that are more expensive outside the plan that they can, they can take advantage with their uh, retiring employer. Um, so, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm sure Matt has way more to talk about there, but those are some of the ones that come to mind almost immediately. Yeah, you, you covered the two sides of it, Christina. Uh, I'll just share a personal story. When I was on the investment advisor side, uh, we worked with a company in a rural area of the state that I lived in. Um, and most of their employees, it was the main employer in that town, right? Um, and most of their employees worked there for 20, 30 plus years. And uh, their CFO just felt very strongly that they should do more for their participants that, than them having reached age 60 or 65 and saying, good luck. Um, and then seeing them outside, whether it's a church or a local grocery store, and they're struggling to try to recreate this paycheck. It was uh, very much so the paternalistic side that drove that decision more so than uh, having larger balances in the plan towards retirement. And I would venture to guess that that's uh, the ultimate driver for most plan sponsors. Doug, you want a final shot before we uh, turn it back to Keaton on that question? Nothing really to add from my perspective. Over to you, Keaton. All right. So over to you, Keaton. To, uh, we are ready to close. We are ready for close. I uh, just want to say briefly, thanks again to our three panelists for taking some time and really jump-starting uh, the thought leadership series that Asset Strategy Consultants has put together this year. Uh, hopefully everyone listening this afternoon got some ideas on ways to optimize their plan. Just like I dusted off my tie this morning, I hope that some of these ideas will help plan sponsors dust off the design that they have for their, their employees and really uh, lean on asset strategy consultants to help talk about customization, retirement income, and putting some, some new features in plan design. Uh, to work for not only themselves as the plan sponsor, but uh, for the plan participants as well. Uh, with that, it looks like we're at two o'clock on the nose. I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. I look forward to helping you in the future. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.